Founded Babies First podcast brought to you by FAIR. I'm Tracy Stump, and this is Dr. Ruchi Gupta. Hello, my best friend. How are you? Doing good. It's a good day. It's getting warm. Is it getting warm for you? 70 today in Chicago. Does does it feel like the warmer it gets, the less uh, sick kids you see? Or is that a myth? Ooh, well, um, it is a myth this year because this year is really weird with COVID-19 because kids are now going back to school. So we're now starting to see them come in when we did it in the winter like normal you know so we're seeing more asthma attacks for allergies which our guest speaker will talk about probably too it's uh, allergy season so we're seeing a whole lot of that so we're seeing kids just for different reasons yeah this uh this past week my daughter who's going to be one this week got her first fever she had in the first week let me tell you she had uh her first play date and her first sickness which I have like so much guilt about because she's such a bubble baby. You know, she's April, 2020, which is like the height of the pandemic. She's never met another soul besides my husband, myself, and my mom. Like she's just, she's just ingrained in this little germ-free bubble. And I opened it up and I let her play with the kid who plays with other kids. And the next day she got a 104 degree fever. Oh no. Um... Oh my God. And I went, I took her to the doctor immediately. And the doctor was like, we're seeing such an uptick in common colds because everybody's busting their little bubble and getting out there. And every kid has like no immune system anymore because they've all been inside this whole year. And now it's like back to normal and normal being cold and flus. Yes, that's right. And that's why I said, we're seeing it because kids are going back to school. And like you said, I like it. They're open in their bubble. And yeah, it is- it is so true, but she's doing okay. And it's good that her immune system got working a little, you know, kick That's started. what the doctor said too. And I was like, are you sure this is okay? Cause I feel like I cooked my baby's brain last week. Like 104 is so hot. It is very high. That's true. You are correct. Um, yeah. But you know how to take care of that, right? You, you gave a lot her- of Tylenol, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. That's right. Tylenol or, you know, Motrin. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, uh, and I was alternating between the two every three hours. Yes. And then, you know, just wet washcloths or if they get too hot, you put them in the shower. They talked about Mm. all that. Yeah. That's fun stuff, but I'm glad she's socializing and she wasn't scared of this kid, right? She wasn't. No, she did great. She did (laughs) so great. I mean, I'm terrified of other people now because (laughs) I never, I never want my kid to get sick again. That was awful. That was awful. Well, she will. Sorry. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen more before it happens less. Um, I know my son, when he was in daycare, I remember early, he was getting sick so much. And I, I was for sure he had some immune condition because he was always sick. But what you realize is that's just exposure to other kids and it's normal right. and they need to get sick and they need to get colds and, and coughs and all the other things. But if you ever think it is something more than that, definitely take them in. Yeah, I guess that's like my big question is like, when do you know if it's something more or if it's just a common cold? I mean, of course, like the COVID fear is like looming over everybody's over over everybody's head. But I feel like it went away within a couple of days. So I don't think it's COVID. I don't think. But like, how do you how do you know? How do you know when it's something like really scary or just a common cold? You don't. That's why you have us. That's why we (laughs) have jobs is so that you can bring them in and ask us. And, you know, some of the most common things at that age are things like ear infections, if it is going to be more than a viral. I mean, viral is number one, two, and three, kind of like location. So it's viral (laughs) illness, viral illness, viral illness. But after that, they can have things, right? And ear infections, other types of infections um, can happen. So if it's it's going on too long, if the fever is going too high, um, definitely just bring them in and, and visit us again. And yeah, know, let's, we're, it's good to have sick kids again, to some extent, because you do want kids interacting. You do want their immune systems working. Like you said, right. But exciting. She turns one. I know I did it. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. awesome. I'm so <laughs> proud of myself. I think this entire year I've slept 45 minutes. Like I just, I'm running on fumes, but I am so proud of myself and I'm planning like a little birthday party for her. And when I say little, I mean like very small, just like us in balloons. And I just, I feel like it's more for me. Like I'm so proud of myself. You know, that like, I just feel, I feel so accomplished and I'm not one to 
to really feel uh, positive things towards myself. Like I'm not one to gloat, but I really feel good about this one. Well, good for you. I'm proud of you. That's Thank awesome. You. Did it. Proud of me You're too. one done. I love I'm it. I'm one and done. Yeah. Uh, I'm really excited about today's episode. This is truly every single new mom's dream is to be me right now, which is on the line with two world renowned pediatricians at my disposal. Like this is all I want. This is my daughter's birthday wish coming to life for me right now. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I can see it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's just like in what other situations you get to just like sit and chat with two doctors about health. I love, I love asking questions about health. I'm so, I err, I err on the side of insane when it comes to my health and my daughter's health. Do you feel that way? Are you like that or no? Because you know all the answers. No, we're all a little insane and that's okay. And it's okay to be. And this is what we talked about last time, Tracy, right? We shouldn't feel bad about it. You should ask questions. Curiosity and getting information is so, so important. And that's also why I'm so excited to have our guest on because it's kind of what he does is try to help, you know, real people out there looking for questions, get answers through the ways people do social media. And so nobody should feel ever having any guilt for asking all these questions and being interested, Tracy, that's awesome. If you weren't, that would be a little bit of an issue, but <laughs> yeah, well, I've got other issues. Um, let's intro our guest and get the conversation started today. I'm very excited. Uh, this guy is an associate professor of pediatrics in the division of allergy and immunology. Prior to that, he was the director of food allergy, uh, of the food allergy, at the treatment center. This, my friends, is Dr. Stukas. Yay. Hello. Hello. Uh, how are now, you both? on top of all of these incredible accolades, you and uh, Ruchi Gupta are also very good friends. And you're a social media guy, which just ties it all together. Yes. Yeah. Ruchi, yeah. I'm way back. I can't even remember when we first met. It's been years, but we, we tend to uh, catch up at conferences throughout uh, this great land of ours. Um, and we always try to find time to, to catch up and see how we're doing as people. We leave all the medicine stuff aside for the, the auditoriums. And Do you guys ask each other medical questions? How does that work between doctors? I mean, I had a rash once, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. it, but no, no, we, okay. we talk about, um, what do we talk about? We talk about our families and our personal yeah. lives and real people things. We're real people. We're normal people. We talk about things outside of medicine. Yeah. Doctors, they're just like us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Dave's one of my favorite favorite people and favorite allergists um, because he he's kind of like the spokesperson for allergy for us. Oh. Because he is probably the most connected allergist to real people. And I think that's what's so exciting is he takes on that role, which he's tried to teach me and I am so, so bad at, but I'll keep, I'll keep listening and trying to learn, but wait, I'm you're, you're bad at, me. you're bad at what? I'm bad at a lot of things, Tracy, but, um, but the Main one five, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can give you hundreds, but we don't have that kind of time. Um, but social media, like he, oh. he does such a great job, uh, conveying important information to the people who need to hear it, you know, through the way they hear it, you know, through the way they're, they're looking and listening. And I think that's just so, so critical in today's day and age. Um, So yeah, very, very happy to have you with us, Dave. Yeah, this is very exciting. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah. What should we talk about? Uh, You know, my kid, let's just talk about my kid. Oh, by the Um, way, how did well, yeah. While you were, I, w- I was listening in the background and congratulations on, um, it's your daughter, correct? Lois. Yeah. Come, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, while you were talking, I Googled uh, the symptoms that you described and I hate to break it to you. She's normal. Okay. Good joke. Number one. Number two. I, I know. I also Googled th- the symptoms uh, on the half hour, but I also, it just like, it could be normal or it could be death. Like you don't know. That's what I have such a problem with the internet. I have such a problem looking up symptoms on the internet. I have such a problem turning to social media for 
health reasons because of this, because there's so many different options and it feels like everybody has a megaphone right now and everybody's just spewing their opinion in such an authoritative voice that it makes it sound like fact that I, I don't turn to the internet for help. I think that's wise. I think that the internet has a lot to offer, uh, both good and bad. But I'd like to go back to, you know, why was, how was social media created? You guys remember like the, the movie, yeah. the network and Facebook? Yes. Zuckerberg. Yeah. And it was, a, it was an online rating system, right? Like a hot or not. Yeah, but that's, you had to have a college education to get a Facebook. Like it has taken a turn for the worst. Oh, it's, it's off its rails. It is. Yeah. It is. Social media, the way it was created, it wasn't designed for what, what, how it's being used these days. Or as you mentioned, Tracy, everybody out there, um, regardless of whether you have expertise, knowledge, or actual perspective that matters, everybody has an opinion. And social media artificially equates all of those opinions together. Yeah. And it's natural for us to equate number of followers with expertise. Oh, that celebrity has 2 million followers and they're posting information about health. Therefore, they must know what they're talking about. Right. That's not the case at all. And, you know, would anybody out there just driving along the highway, you have a question about your own health, your child's health, would you pull over to the side of the road and flag down the first hundred cars that drove past you and ask their opinion for your own personal health? That's what happens when you go online asking for information. You have no idea who's on the other end. And people just, you know, they tend to trust those that uh, earn their trust, whether it's, it's warranted or not. It's a real problem. That's actually yeah. cool. That's a about it yeah yeah i found um i found social media lately as a new mom and as a new mom in a global health pandemic with a new vaccine on the market i found social media to be incredibly uh anxiety inducing the past year i found it to be really really hard to to like kind of hone in on one voice online and listen to that what have you done, Tracy? What do you, what do you like? Have you been, have you shut it off or, or do you still try? Um, I still look because I think a part of me loves just that feeling of like constant anxiety, but I've really had to like, I've had to tone it back, especially, especially with my kid, because I have to co go into every situation level headed. Like I can't go in there with the energy of these people who you don't, you don't know their credits. Like you, you don't know if they're a doctor or not a doctor and, you know, reading all of their information and then implementing that into your life. I think it can be really detrimental. And that's why I think it's very important to have people like you out in the world who are putting forth information. That's true. It's backed by a credible source because you went to school for this, like, you know what you're talking about. And I think it's really important for people, especially new moms to, to hone in on one voice on the internet and listen to that. But, you know, there's, there's various perspectives. Um, and I agree with you. I think that the source matters and more yeah. than anything, I'm not, you know, social media is never going away. The internet's never going to go away. That it is what it is. But mm -hmm. we, uh, there's no reason why we can't learn critical thinking skills. For all of us, I think mm. that's really important for no matter what you're doing. You know, Ruchi and I, when we, re when we read a research paper, we have learned the critical thinking skills to go through and look at, okay, what was the methodology? What was their inclusion criteria, exclusion okay. criteria? How do they actually look at it? What did they find in regards to their data? Uh, do, were their data interpreted properly? Uh, what are the limitations to their data? How does this actually apply to the real world and patients, you know, you know and out in the scheme of things? And then more importantly, how does this one study fit in with the, uh, you know, the total body of evidence that's out there? Does it actually move the needle or does it not? Uh, can we disregard it? But, you know, it's taken us years to get to that point where we can do that. Um, but if you don't have those critical thinking skills, you don't have that skill set to do it, and you go online looking for information, it's very easy to sort of uh, go off information and disinformation out there, unfortunately. And snake oil has been sold for hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not going to go away. And it's just taken on a different shape and form online. And unfortunately, they're looking for people that are living with chronic health conditions that have no known cause, no known cure, and they're preying on you. Yeah. Yeah. And it becomes a feedback loop, I've found, where it's just like, uh, people make a meme and then that meme gets passed around and then all of a sudden that meme is that person's health advice and that health advice goes to the next blog. And it's just this, it's just this echo chamber of insanity. If you don't have the right source 
at the top. And I found that very few times have I found the right source at the top. Even like, I hate to say it, even WebMD makes me a little bit crazy. Like I go on there and I put in like my symptoms and stuff. And then next thing you know, I'm dead. Like I'm buying a coffin. Like I just, it's, it's insanity. It's insanity. So I think I love, I love that both of you have a presence on the internet. And I love that you guys are kind of doing the, the good that more people should be doing. There needs to be more of you. That's, that's my problem with social media and medicine there. I'm, I'm so, I feel so passionate about it because there's so much misinformation and you could get led down the wrong trail so quickly. Yeah. And, you know, I think one positive that's come out of social media is kind of to Dave's point for those of us who can evaluate that research. Cause a lot of times we publish our research in academic journals that mm -hmm. people don't even have access to. So you don't even know it exists. So yeah. how do you get that data out there to people who need it? And that's been a, a big emphasis even in our center is we publish a lot of patient facing stuff, but a lot of times it sits in journals. So how do we break it down and then put it out for people to be able to use to you know advance their management of their conditions and help them figure out what's next and what they yeah. should. And social media is a way to get valid information also out to people, but you have to be able to, to figure out what's right and what's wrong and what's, you know, studied and what's snake oil. And Dave, I was wondering from your point of view, like, how do people do that? How do you navigate? Well, uh, I think it starts with uh, vetting your resources. So we always want to start with good, credible uh, professional organizations or those who actually have uh, the right credentialing to offer their, their opinion. Uh, and then see if you can verify it. So don't just stop at the first thing you read. Verify it with another independent source. And if you can't do it, then immediately question you know, what you're reading. Always be aware of conflicts of interest. So what I mean by that is if the person who is giving you health information is standing to profit by selling you services, their book, or um, any of their supplements or products because of the information they gave you, that's a huge red flag. Because uh, they're really just, they're trying to sell it to you. That's marketing. That's not information. Um, we need to be aware of our own echo chambers. We tend to congregate with like-minded individuals because it reinforces our previously held beliefs. It's really comfortable. You know, I want to cuddle up with a nice cozy blanket. I don't want to sit on a bed of nails all day. Um, so we, but if we, if we always listen to those same voices, it gives us an altered, uh, perception of reality. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, with the food allergy community, especially online, this is one thing I talk to our colleagues about when I give talks on this. Their perception of reality is often very different than what we see in the actual world and the patients that we see. I see patients from all backgrounds. There's a bell-shaped curve to everything that we see in, in medicine. Most people fall in the middle, but there are outliers on both ends. If you just have the outliers talking about their experience, it skews the conversation, making people think that that's the reality that most people are living with. Think about a Yelp review. You're going to go find a new restaurant. Who takes the time to go and put a, a review about that restaurant? People who have a, had a wonderful experience or people who had an awful experience. The people in the middle aren't going to take the time to do that or, or people getting paid to put their comments out there. So it's, you know, there's a lot, it's very complicated. There's a lot to it, but vet your resources. It's okay to take time to digest the information and see if you can trust it before you act on it. Yeah. That's a big one for me is like taking a beat and being like, is this real or is this just somebody who watched one documentary bootlegged off the internet and now is like writing an article on some outsourced website, you know, like it's, you do, you have to take that minute and just be like, all right, let's, uh, let's fact check this. Yeah. You know, we're, we're so used to, um, living in a world where we have to, we feel like we need to have opinions on everything, which we don't. And by the way, I, I highly recommend trying that. I found stoicism during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful for me to say, that's interesting. I don't need to have an opinion on that. I'm going to let other people worry about that. <laughs> it's very freeing in many ways. Yeah. Um, but then we, we don't have to act on it. So take time, digest it. You know, think about before social media, how do we get our information? You know, we would get it you know, with the evening news or the daily newspaper, or if you go online and you read it a couple times a day or something like that. But now it's just constant updating and things mm -hmm. change so quickly. It doesn't allow any of us time to actually think about it and, and really form an educated, informed opinion. 
Yeah, I think the best example with all of this stuff that we're all experiencing on a moment to moment basis is all of this vaccine information. And now they're doing vaccine trials on kids. And it's just, especially on social media, everybody has an opinion about it. And not everybody went to med school that's talking, you know, about it. And it's just, it's a lot. It's a full-time job kind of keeping that out of your, your zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, very true. Have you uh, heard the term doom scrolling? Oh, girl, I have. A, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, so I, uh, I graduated in doom scrolling. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I'm guilty. You go to bed and you're yeah. like, oh, I'll just, I'll just check real fast, see if there's anything I need to get back to. 30 minutes later, you're scrolling like, oh my gosh. I These know. variants are coming. Are there variants in my room right now? <laughs> oh, I need to, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And it's, I I mean, yeah, it's addictive. So social media was created to turn us into addicts. Mm. That's the, the bottom line. Their whole goal was to get us to stay as engaged as, as much as possible. It's like playing a slot machine. There's variable reinforcement. We go on there, especially adolescents. They are very prone to this. And Ruchi knows all about this as well. Like yeah. you, you need the dings, you need the dopamine hit from people yeah. saying like, and retweeting and we all do it if i post something and people don't retweet it or like mm. it oh my gosh what is this saying about me is this does this mean i'm worthless as a person and it's mm. really bad when it comes to self-image with with teenagers on That's instagram true. other places like that with body filters and all kinds of crazy stuff but yeah. i'll take a deep breath there because i uh i don't want to go too too far down the rabbit hole too soon <laughs> yeah. this well, is, it's like the the pluses and minuses right people are able to get information faster right that has also been incredibly beneficial right? like videos get posted and people find out and people you know go to action for different causes you know in such a such a faster way you see things happening all around the world so much quicker and easier so that aspect but then going into this aspect of then how do you now control it it's almost like we always talk about almost with everything it's a pendulum right you you have nothing then you like go all the way to the other side and you have everything. And how do we get it back to the middle where we can live normal lives, get the advantages of being connected, but not, you know, all the traps and addictions. And I'm right there with you, Dave. I mean, I have two, two teens at home and, and it is, you got to put those rules in place. Otherwise the phone is just in your hand nonstop all the time. And it's very challenging. And that's why I can't do social media because I guess I do the doom thing that you were talking about is that I, I try to like post and I go on, I start reading. And then, like you said, 30 minutes or an hour later, you're like, oh, OK, wait, what was I what was I trying to do in the first place? So. It robs you of your joy. You know, it really does. It really it's a joy suck. But then there's people like you, Dave, who are out there doing the Lord's work and putting out information that is valid and real. And it's it's moving the needle forward in a very positive direction. And it makes social media and medicine bright. And like it feels like there's there's a positive future in it when people like you are at the helm. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I when I first joined social media, it's about eight years ago, and I, I joined Twitter, um, and now I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, I, I went on there because of all the misinformation I kept hearing from mm. patients and families and referring providers, and I kept thinking, where is this coming from? So I spent a lot of time looking at the origins uh, of the misinformation, and I became a little bit of a self-proclaimed mythbuster. In fact, I had Mythbuster Mondays on Twitter where I would dispel like 15 different myths, you know, once a month, and it got very popular. And I even started, you know, giving talks like that at national conferences to our colleagues. Like, listen, this is where all this misinformation is coming from. So when your patients come to you with these questions, now you can combat it and use evidence to to kind of sort things out. What and was I the realized, biggest myth that you busted? Like, what was the biggest myth that people were were coming to you with? Oh my gosh, you you name it. So you know, uh, here's the biggest one that everybody always it's really popular. There is no such thing as a hypoallergenic dog. That's the that's myth, true. or that's the truth? That's the truth. Sorry. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's a marketer's dream. Uh, they sell yeah. different breeds and they say it's the hair length, the shedding and all this other stuff. And people pay you know, twice as much money. But every single dog will have dander coming from its saliva, its skin or its urine. And dog dander is what causes allergy symptoms for those who have dog allergy. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. If but, allergists tell me you need to get a hypoallergenic dog. Yeah, no. There are, get a there refund are. on my dog. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, I mean, but so there's that. Oh, the other, the other good one is 10% of the general population is walking around reporting they have a penicillin allergy, 
but 95% of those people aren't actually allergic to penicillin. But that's a tough one to find out, right? Well, if you get the word out there, more people, and we're, we're doing this on multiple levels. So we're educating primary care physicians about how to address this. And uh, there are, you know, well established penicillin allergy delabeling programs. We have to educate the general public as well to even ask about it. Uh, so we're getting there, but it, it takes a long, long time uh, to dispel yeah. myths that we all hold to be true. So do people just think that they're allergic to penicillin? So they're just like, yes, I'm allergic to this because it's scary well, if you say no, and then you are. No, they're, they're mistakes. It's not, it's oftentimes it's, it's on us as medical professionals because we're actually misdiagnosing them. So there's, there's poor understanding in regards to actual risk. So a lot of times delayed onset rashes in children, they can just get it again. They're fine. Common mm -hmm. side effects like upset stomach or diarrhea. That's not a true allergy. You can get it again. People are avoiding it because their parent says that they were allergic to penicillin and they mm -hmm. mistakenly feel it's inherited. Uh, lo and behold, it's not inherited and the parent probably isn't allergic in the first place. <laughs> so it's really complicated, but it's a huge problem because if, you, if you're walking around thinking you're allergic to this, you're, you're not going to get a really effective treatment for the vast majority of you know, common bacterial infections like strep throat and ear infections. That's right. This is good, Dave. What else? Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, give us more myths. Yeah, what I like myth? that. Yeah. So you, uh, a lot of your listeners are interested in food allergy. Um, so there's a common misconception that the size of a food allergy skin prick or blood test mm -hmm. indicates the severity of future reactions. And that is not the case at all. Yeah. And I've met too many mothers that are in tears thinking that their kid's going to die because somebody told them, oh my God, I've never seen a peanut allergy this yeah. size. They have a deathly peanut allergy. Um, it's not fair to them. It's just not. And that's not the case at all. The size of an allergy test result only indicates the likelihood of allergy being present. It's also a reason why these aren't screening tests. And there are people out there that get these large panels done. They get a piece of paper that says, oh my gosh, you're allergic to 35 different foods because this silly test says so. That's not how they work. The best test is what happens. Guilty. To food. Yeah. If you eat the food without any problems, you're not allergic to it. You're not sensitive yeah. to it. You're not intolerant to it. The best test is ingestion. If you no, are, what about a baby? My baby can't be like, mom, I feel a little itchy and my belly hurts. Like, how do you know if a baby's allergic to something without them breaking out in a rash? Well, you have one of the world's experts on here as well, Dr. Gupta. I so, do. There's a myth, right? Most people think babies are going to die the first time they eat peanut. Is that the case? No, it is not. And our study and others have shown that infants typically don't even have those very, very severe symptoms. We see it in older kids occasionally with the respiratory and the cardiovascular. And tip, the most common symptoms are vomiting and hives. And you can see both of those without your baby having to tell you they're not feeling good. You know, so yes. Yeah. Uh, what about exactly right, Dave? And that is a big myth that we need to bust because people are scared to introduce these foods to their, their babies because they think they're gonna, you know, have this severe anaphylactic reaction. And that's partially on us because, you know, for a long time, there was a lot of fear and, and promoting of, you know, like this whole concept of anaphylaxis and, and potential death. And so we got we to gotta kind of reverse a little bit. What do you think, Dave? You're right. I, I say this all the time. Pediatricians, um, we have done an excellent job of scaring the hell out of parents of just simply feeding their babies. Oh, my gosh, we've done so much harm. We didn't do it on purpose, though. It was, it was the best. We're all doing the best we can with the information available at the time. So the information available at the time when recommendations were first put out there 20 years ago indicated that if we avoid these foods then we could delay, you know, food allergies. Well, now we know with good evidence that that's not the case. So science, go science. Science has helped us answer these questions and it's evolved our understanding. And now we know the earlier we introduce these allergenic foods to babies and keep it in the diet on a consistent basis, that's our best path towards preventing food allergies to begin with. So now yeah. we have a whole generation of parents scared out of their minds to let their babies eat, whereas that's the best thing for them because it's very low risk and it's the best way to keep them from getting allergies in the first place. And like, to be clear, evidence isn't my cousin in Tucson's neighbor fed her baby eggs and it wound up in the hospital three days later. Like that's not fact-based evidence. That would be an anecdote. And anecdotes are problematic because right. anecdotes are simply one person's story that does not constitute evidence. Uh, no, we actually have great randomized prospective controlled trials. This is the mm -hmm. gold standard way for trying to answer a question. You take two groups and you, you control for everything except for one variable. One group, you feed them peanut and keep in their diet. The other group, you keep peanut out of their diet. You reevaluate down the road. And the biggest trial, the LEAP trial, they happen to follow them for five years or up until the age of five. 
And they found a dramatic difference in those who ate peanuts on a regular basis that they weren't developing peanut allergy nearly as much as the infants who avoided it. So we have great evidence. And there's other studies as well. Absolutely. What's your guys' vibe on those at-home allergy tests? Wait, wait, wait. Before I let Dave get on that, I <laughs> wanted to tell Dave that I watched Tracy feed Lois her first peanut. And she did amazing and loved it. And it was super fun. We'll have to share that. So Tracy, you know this firsthand. Like Tracy was scared and then yeah. had no issue with it. It was just the easiest thing for her. Yeah. But I do want to, you know, just to just put in a plug, you know, it some kids will react, but know that if they react, you know, that you'll take them to an allergist and figure out what's going on and then move forward with whatever direction. But those reactions are typically mild. So that fear is, um, shouldn't happen because you will gain so much more by starting it. And then there's this whole piece about severe eczema. So if you, they do have severe eczema, we talked about this before, Tracy, just see your pediatrician and potentially an allergist and, you know, get, go early though, go, if they have eczema at two months, get in because we need those kids started as early as possible. Um, and, you know, with FAIR, we're actually doing a, a whole trial on um, some of the top other allergens to try to do this in the U.S. And so we're getting that um, going and it's going to be it's going to be really enlightening because we need to really push. We talk about peanut all the time, but there's a lot of other allergens out there that we need to verify. All right. OK, now for the more uh, more entertaining stuff, Dave, answer Tracy's question. Answer my question, David. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Wait, what was the question again? Um, it was <laughs> <laughs> the at home, at home allergy test. Are you pro right, right, right. against what's the vibe uh, against? So aller these, it, okay. There's IgE antibody, immunoglobulin, mm -hmm. which is involved in traditional food allergy responses. If you, have, I just said, mm -hmm, like I knew, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you have IgE, uh, preformed to a food, uh, protein, every time you eat that food within minutes, it's not going to be the next day or days later within minutes. Usually you're going to have uh, rapid onset reproducible symptoms every time you eat the food. We're talking like hives, itching, swelling, vomiting, uh, anaphylaxis type symptoms. That's IgE. Then you have IgG. IgG is not involved in food allergy. IgG is a memory antibody. When we all get our COVID vaccines, we form IgG towards the spike protein. Therefore, if we actually encounter the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus in real life, our IgG says, you don't belong here. I'm going to fight you off and prevent severe illness. IgG is a normal response to things that we're exposed to, including foods but a lot of people are marketing IgG tests as some diagnostic marker for food sensitivity or intolerance. And it's not, it's not validated to do that. It has no, no utility whatsoever in the evaluation of anybody. Neither of these tests are screening tests. In order to have a good screening test, you need to meet certain, you know, very specific criteria. Uh, number one would be, you know, does the test measure what it's supposed to measure? So with IgG, no. IgE, well, it does, but it doesn't diagnose anything. So mm -hmm. IgE tests alone don't diagnose food allergy. They only indicate the likelihood of allergy based upon the history. Other things to consider would be, uh, are there false positives with testing? Yes, there are tons of false positives, 50% false positives. So wow. you're going to cause a lot of harm by you know, getting these elevated levels back for food allergy tests and somebody who's sensitized but actually tolerant and not allergic. And then lastly, can you prevent anything if with early detection? That's a huge part of any screening test. No, you can't. Because IgE tests, actually, you may cause food allergy. Because if somebody is sensitized but not allergic, they absolutely need to eat that food and keep it in their diet on a regular basis. But all these panels do is they lead to unnecessary avoidance, overdiagnosis, and misdiagnosis. Why don't people get more worked up about false negatives? We don't see many false negatives. That's the Really? That's the, yeah. Yeah. So the negative predictive value is very, very high. Um, now, that being said, this is why, again, you can't just rely on some at-home test to diagnose anything. Right. If you legitimately say, hey, Dave, every time I eat shrimp, within minutes, I'm blowing up like, you know, hitch, and I have my ears out here, and I'm covered <laughs> in hives, and I'm itching, uh, but my tests are negative for whatever reason, I'm going to say, well, don't eat shrimp, or come to my office, eat it in mm -hmm. front of me in a very slow, gradual manner during an oral food challenge, which is the gold standard way to diagnose food allergy. When the history is wishy-washy, or the testing is indeterminate, come eat it in front of you. It's a very safe way to do it. We gain good information. If you can eat a couple of servings without having any problems, you're not allergic to it. So mm. we can figure this out. And then what do you do if they are allergic to it? EpiPen? 
Well, yeah, then we're, then we, we, we counsel on avoidance. Um, so we spend a lot of time educating about the various risks. So we always want to focus on preventing accidental ingestion. Ingestion is the, the form of exposure that is, causes the highest potential for any type of allergic reaction, especially anaphylaxis. Mm. We also counsel people at things like other myths, like there are people with shellfish allergy that say, I can't go in the ocean. That's insane. Yes, you can go in the ocean. I mean, don't grab shrimp as they swim by and eat it while you're swimming, that, but that, that'd be foolish anyways. But you can go in the ocean and be around these things because casual exposure is not going to cause a reaction, especially from something like that. I bet that person saw a meme on their aunt's Facebook about shrimp in the ocean, and that's how they got that, that diagnosis. It was a Reddit. It was a Reddit column. I saw this. Even better. It was wow. awful. I was reading. I was horrified when I read it. I, oh, my gosh. It's all this misinformation, and it's just like... And the way they, they say it so confidently, like, well, of course, you'd be insane to do that because of blah, 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 blah. Can I ask you a question? Is there a, a link between Tylenol and asthma? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, there, there's, a, so there's a lot of different correlations with common childhood exposures and common childhood conditions. Okay. Um, so what do we often give to babies when they have fevers or they're not feeling well? We'll use either Tylenol or we use, you know, ibuprofen and Motrin and things like that. Yeah. We also use antibiotics regularly and we also use anti-reflux medications regularly as well for kids who spit up a lot. Well, these are common medications that are used in a lot of babies. And then um, eczema, asthma or wheezing and, you know, other conditions are common conditions as well. So there's a lot of mm. times you find these correlation between the two. But when you actually do the studies to look at does one actually cause the other, uh, that science really hasn't panned out, at least that I'm aware of. I don't know if Ruchi has seen anything else, especially with Tylenol. No, I mean, think about how hard it is to do cause and effect, right? There's a lot of things that we're doing at the same time, and then you right. develop asthma, right? So which piece really was it? And so that's where I think there's so much confusion because there's a lot of, as you said, correlations, as Dave said, or associations, but not cause effect. And that freaks people out. And then people end up stopping so many things that may have not been really any relationship to the end result at all. So I think you have to be very careful with that. And we are too, when we write these papers, because right. we're looking at two things, but there's another 10 things you can't, we say you control for, you know, you try to take them out of the equation, but it's mm -hmm. not easy. And that's why those RCTs, Dave mentioned, you know, those randomized controlled trials are so important because you're actually doing something in one group and not doing something in another group to try to predict the actual, you know, effect of it. So yeah, now I'm, I'm with you and we cannot stop giving babies Tylenol. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bad. Absolutely. Yeah. And this leads also to um, why self-diagnosis is really filled with a lot of um, incorrect diagnosis. And the reason why is because um, it's really hard to control for other factors. And as human beings, it's natural for us to correlate. You know, we see this all the time in people who feel that they have a food intolerance or sensitivity. They say it must be because of gluten. Uh, well, why is that? Well, because I read online that, you know, gluten sensitivity can cause whatever, fatigue, muscle weakness, poor sleep, who knows what. I haven't been feeling that well, so I'm going to take gluten out of my diet. And then, you know, four to six weeks later, they say, okay, I've been, I've been gluten-free and I've been feeling great. Oh, that's great. What else have you done? Well, I started exercising more. I cut back on my alcohol. I stopped smoking and I actually am sleeping better. And I and I've been seeing you know, a therapist to talk about all my anxiety, but it must be the gluten. Well, how do you know it's the gluten? Well, because I stopped eating gluten and I felt better. But you also did these six other things. And how do you know it wasn't one of them? So, you know, that's one example, but we see that all the time. Yeah. We all want to be detectives. We're all doing the homeland board in our offices, trying to connect all the dots, trying to figure it out. Yeah. And there's, I mean, the placebo effect is as good as many remedies. We know mm. that, right? So if you do something and your mind thinks you're going to have an effect, a lot of times that effect happens. And so you got to keep that really clear in your mind that the placebo effect is very powerful. Uh, positive and negative. If you think you're going to have a bad reaction, chances are you're going to have a bad reaction. <laughs> oh, you guys, this is so much information. What, like from both of you, what are your take home, take home tips to just kind of like distill it down in, in our minds and, and kind of like help us figure out what we're doing. Well, you know, I would say since we've been talking about social media, just um, be aware of the common pitfalls on online. Uh, be yeah. aware that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, it's helpful to understand our own cognitive biases. 
confirmation mm -hmm. bias is very strong. We all tend to uh, believe things that sort of corroborate our previously held beliefs and refute things that don't really agree with what we hold to be true. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to unpack here. So proceed with caution when, look, when looking online. I think there's a lot of benefits, social media, especially in the food allergy community, you can find people that are, you know, understand what you're going through. A lot of times the same anxieties and uh, they may have very good practical tips about you're sending your child to school for the first time or you're, you're traveling with food allergies or, you know, certain uh, restaurants or foods that may be safe compared to others. So there's a lot of good out there, but there's also a lot of bad. But ultimately, um, I would really hope that people would trust their personal doctor as well. And I love having these conversations. I love when families come to me and they say, Dave, I read this online. What do you think? And we talk about it. Mm. I've had calls all, you know, every they're safe and effective and that's the way we're going to get out of the pandemic. Okay. I can go I'm into it you know, if you'd like. <laughs> I, I would honestly, that's all I want to talk about right now. Yeah, no. So I'll, I'll stop talking, but you know, that bottom line is, um, as with anything in life, um, we just need to be thoughtful about sort of how we navigate things and gather information and, uh, you know, just be critical about, you know, the information that we're getting and, and trying to trust it or not. Yeah, I'll second everything Dave said, because he is the expert on that, but um, adding just a little bit, just when you get information, don't stop, you know, go look around. But like Dave said earlier, like validate it with other information. And then if it's around health, I, I think support groups are the best thing in the world. You know, having these groups during COVID has been just so good for people to be able to communicate and talk to people and and interact because we have missed that so much. So it's not that it's all bad and get advice about stuff. And if it's not significant to your health, then do it. You know, exercise is good. Eating healthy is good. Getting sleep is good. There's, there's a lot of good stuff, but, um, and, and techniques to do that are also good to try. But when it comes to something that may impact your health, like, oh, I had a reaction. I'm going to avoid this food talk to your doctor, talk to your allergist, because, you know, in our study, I keep saying it over and over, one in five adults are avoiding a food because they think they have a food allergy, mm -hmm. but only one in 20 adults are seeing their doctor. So that shows you that there are tons of people who just stop eating it because they think they may have something. And we know how hard it is to avoid and why take something tasty out of your diet for no reason. So going back to that, you know, just verify any information you're seeing out there with your doctor. And then if it is food related with your allergist. And our what's our slogan? You know, do your best. We're all doing our best. Keep yeah. Doing your best. Forget do about your that. best, let go of the rest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave, where can we follow you on the interwebs? Uh, my handle is at allergy kids doc on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, so I'd love it if uh, people would check out my accounts and, you know, uh, I, I interact with folks all the time. I can never give individual medical advice and I feel awful, but it's probably every other day somebody sends me a message and they, they give me like their child's blood test results or they, they give me all these personal details. And every single time it, it's heartbreaking, but I say, you know, unfortunately, I can't give you individual medical advice. I strongly encourage you to talk to your personal doctor because there's yeah. a lot of nuances and details that will really impact your diagnosis and care. Uh, in case you can't tell, I practice that quite a bit, but um, it's just copy yeah. and paste. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, and if I could, you know, the wonderful people listening to this also don't send me pictures of your rashes. Um, I don't <laughs> like opening my direct messages to see a giant rash. Oh, <laughs> joking, but I'm not joking. Like it's not good. I don't want that. Don't oh, need... I do not put it past the internet to send you pictures of just about anything. They are Wow. They're an interesting bunch, the people on the dark web. Yep. Well, as you guys are doom scrolling, if you want to take a break from all the insanity, you can go over to babiesfirst.org for more information or go to foodallergies.org and get all of your food allergy information over there. Dave, thank you so much for doing this. I feel enlightened and relieved all at the same time. Oh, can I add to that then? Because you, before you're so proud of yourself to getting to Lois's first year of life. I did. Well, we got three more days. So. Yeah, what, but you're not done yet. Oh, there's you, more? You, you have to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's like 
Yeah, there's there's there's, after, there's stuff after that. So. No, no, no. I signed up for one year. It was just a one year program, and then I was done. You're, it, it'll be okay. Thanks for your time. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> high five, Dave. We gotta do our high fives. You are awesome. It's yeah, great. Dave. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go uh, stalk you right now, and I've got a question about this thing on my foot. So <laughs> take lots of pictures of it. <laughs> I want to know what it smells and tastes like too. Oh, I'll let you know exactly what it tastes like. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. Ruchi, thank you. Dave, thank you. Tracy, thank you. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Awesome. Bye. Have fun. Bye.